Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, stream processing meetup. We have uh, three presenters tonight. So I'm just gonna go over some uh, background frequently asked questions. All right, so first up is uh, welcome and some frequently asked questions. We have three presentations. First one is uh, real-time data processing using Azure Stream Analytics. Next is cruise control in Cloudera data platform. And uh, we'll finish with partial update in Venice. So common question is, are the talks recorded? Yes, the talks are recorded. We'll, uh, uh, once the recording's done, we'll post them on our YouTube channel. It'll typically take a few days, but uh, they'll uh, land there. So you can see the talks if you miss part of them or you wanna tell somebody else about it who wasn't here um, or look back at them. If you're interested in presenting at a future one of these meetups, you can uh, post a message on the meetup site, or you can send a message to any of your hosts. That would be uh, F.A., uh, myself, uh, or uh, or Gary. Uh, our email addresses are there, so you can contact us that way if, you, if you're interested in presenting at a future meetup. Um, there is a, in this webinar, there's a, a Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can ask questions. Um, and then at the end of each talk, the presenters will uh, answer the questions time permitting and uh, uh, you can get, get more details about your questions at the end. And uh, I think that's it. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Gary to introduce our first speaker. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, yeah, let me introduce the first speaker of this meetup, uh, Ajita. Ajita is a senior product manager at Azure Stream Analytics. Uh, she has been in the space for the last four years. She has been a speaker at Microsoft Build, Microsoft Ignite, Integrate 2022, and various meetups. Uh, she's going to talk about real-time data processing using Azure Stream Analytics with or without code. Let's pass it on to you, Ajita. Great. Can you hear me OK? Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ajita, and as David introduced, I am a senior product manager at Azure Stream Analytics. I'll be talking about what Azure Stream Analytics is and how you can process your real-time data with code, without code. I'll be uh, walking you through some functionality, some common architecture patterns, and then I'll dive into two exciting demos for you. All right, so what is real-time analytics and uh, real-time so, processing? Ajita, uh, yep. have you shared the slides? Uh, oh. oh, one second. Perfect, thank you. All right, so what is uh, real-time processing? It's about unlocking real-time insights when time to action is critical. So let's say if you're doing a credit card and you want to understand if there is a fraud, you want to understand within milliseconds, not even seconds or minutes. Um, or there is a upsell or cross sell on the web, you want to understand in real time what's happening. Or let's say there's a overheated engine or a fridge, you want to have that kind of a processing and metrics and alerting in real time within seconds or minutes. So that's what real time processing is that you get time to insight and you, in time, and you can take action in time as well. So stream analytics is relevant across multiple industries because it's a real time processing. So it's about real time fraud detection, streaming ETL, predictive maintenance, and customer behavior production. Um, so customers today have data or people have data in um, all these scenarios across industries today. Um, there's healthcare where some patient monitoring is needed, or let's say connected cars, or even real-time marketing. So how does stream processing help those people to get their real-time data into Azure and how they can process that data? So let's look into this um, common patterns. So as you can see here, we have uh, or people have their real-time data in IoT devices, or they have their data in 
logs or files or media, or they might have some financial transactions coming in or some real-time weather data, or it could be some business applications. Now, they, these real-time data can be get into or ingested into Azure via IoT Hub or maybe Event Hub or uh, even Data Lake or Blob. Now, people do use Kafka. So today, Event Hub has a support for Kafka endpoint. So even if you have data in Kafka, then you can get it into Event Hub. And once, <coughs> sorry, once you get your data into Event Hub or IoT Hub, let's say if you have sensors, real-time data, then uh, Azure Stream Analytics can take that data and analyze your data in real-time analytics. You can also combine it with um, some either reference data in, let's say, if you have it in SQL DB or Blob, or you can always also bring in your Azure ML models uh, for real-time scoring. So in ASA, we have support for ML models so that if you are, let's say, a developer and not even a ML person, you don't know how to write machine learning code, uh, you can just bring in your ML models very easily in Azure Stream Analytics. Now, once Azure Stream Analytics analyze your data, how does it send it to some destination? So today in Azure Stream Analytics, we support 11 plus destinations. And there could be multiple scenarios for you for processing. There could be that uh, you want to send some kind of a derived events. Maybe you want to just do some filtering or aggregation on your real-time events, or you want to build some kind of dashboarding in Power BI. Or maybe you want to send to um, uh, warehousing. So we support Synapse, Blob, SQL DB as well. Um, or you want to so do maybe some log telemetry analytics, um, or maybe you want to do dynamic applications. So the essence of this uh, slide is that how the data flows from where your data is in the source, your real-time data, and how you can get it into Azure, how you can process through Azure Stream Analytics, and then you can send it to these many destinations in Azure very easily. So what are the key differentiators and highlights for Azure Stream Analytics? ASA is a productive, hybrid, intelligent, and trusted. So what does that mean? So productive basically means today in Azure Stream Analytics, you can write SQL code. Um, if you're a SQL developer, it's super easy. You can write it and uh, it's extensible with JavaScript, C Sharp. You can write your windowing functions because they're, uh, for real-time analytics generally, there is a aggregation or some kind of uh, transformation that needed to be done through time window. So you can do that easily through SQL code. Or if you do not want to write SQL code, we also support no code editor. And I'll give you a demo as well for that. But basically uh, you do not have to write any code and you can do a drag and drop experience and create your end-to-end -end, uh, processing very easily. We integrate with other Azure services that I just showed you. And for doing that, like as I showed you, Azure Stream Analytics come, uh, has various sources and destinations. You do not have to write a single line of code for doing that. Uh, that's zero code integration. Uh, and we have uh, very good like debugging, diagnostics, and we also support VS Code. Uh, what does hybrid mean? So you can run your logic um, in the cloud and it can be multi-tenant or dedicated. Uh, you can deploy your logic on IoT Edge, or you can run on-premise using Azure Stack as well. Uh, what does intelligent mean? So I think I mentioned previously as well, you can bring in your ML functions and you can very easily integrate with Azure ML. Uh, we also have very, uh, we also have built-in geospatial functions. A lot, of a lot of people have scenarios where they want to do some kind of, let's say aggregation based on, um, geo, uh, geospatial function related data. So those kind of scenarios are supported very easily. And also how your jobs or stream analytics jobs are flowing um, and how can you make it parallel? You don't have to worry about that. Uh, automatically the jobs are uh, parallel and there are tools in the, in, in the jobs which can help you with that. Uh, trusted, so we have uh, 3 in SLA and we have no data loss and very secure connection. You can you can use uh, VNet as well and dedicate it today and enable your private endpoints. 
Some advanced analytics uh, the, uh, is that we have some geospatial analytics scenarios that we support. A lot of people ask about how can we have phone tracking across, let's say, cell sites or maybe some kind of asset tracking, how the trucks are going here and there, or um, some kind of fleet management, or they want to do some kind of management for their facilities, or maybe ride sharing, um, so or geofencing. So to support these kind of scenarios, we support geospatial functions. Uh, so as I said, you we can write a very simple SQL query in Azure Stream Analytics, and uh, this is just example of some geospatial functions which you can write in your query, and it makes it very easy for you. Uh, to achieve those geospatial scenarios. So this actually shows you an example of, uh, let's say you want to see an event when a gas station is very nearby, it's like literally within a few miles or kilometers from the car. So you can write a very simple SQL-like query where you can say, I want to select my location and station location, and I want to join it with the distance and accordingly calculate when it's less than X amount. So th these kind of geospatial functions make it very easy for you to do the uh, geospatial processing and transformations. The other one is built-in ML models. Uh, so sometimes customers or people have scenario that we want to see spikes or dips when let's say a heater is overheated, um, a generator is overheated, or some engine is overheated, or some fridge is overheated, um, we don't want things to go bad. So for that, uh, we provide uh, anomaly detection functions. And there are generally five types of anomalies that can be detected, like spikes and dips or positive, negative trend. Um, and that can be done by having very easy Azure ML callouts. Um, so you can do real-time scoring using custom model uh, deployed using Azure ML services. And you can see in the screenshot that you do not have to write any code. Uh, you bring in your ML model and just refer it in your SQL query, and you'll be able to get your AML models used. All right, I'll just show you what Azure Stream Analytics, just very high level recent announcements that we did. We have been doing it for a very long time and we keep announcing new stuff, but just to give you an idea of what Azure Stream Analytics is. So, we uh, now support Delta Lake output. Um, so it's like, a, it's a native support of Delta Lake output in stream analytics jobs. And then you can write your streaming data into Delta table uh, without writing any code. Uh, we also support PostgreSQL and Azure Data Explorer output. So as I said, sometimes people have log or telemetry analytics and they want to send to ADX, which is a very popular destination. And then on top of that, they want to run some analytics or I want to build some Power BI dashboard. So with those kind of scenario, this is helpful. We also have like a job diagram simulator, which helps you in troubleshooting and diagnosing issues in your jobs. So it you can act, visualize your job topology from source to destination, and then identify where any issues are. You can see if your jobs are parallel, uh, how many partitions are being used and how the data is flowing from one um, X partitions to Y partitions. So that, that really helps in um, troubleshooting your jobs. No code editor, as I said, um, and I'll show you a demo as well. We support that you are able to create your Azure Stream Analytics job through SQL or SQL with extensible language, or you can do it through no code editor as well, where you do not have to write any single line of code. Um, and we have a query editor. We continuously keep improving and I would say give it a try and then uh, always open to feedback, but uh, it's very easy to use editor if you try it. You can very easily plug in your source and then you can write a quick query and then very easily plug in your destination as well. Um, and we also have auto scale, so you don't have to worry about um, how many units you have to give for scalable infrastructure. So let's look at this demo. So in this demo, this is around how Stream Analytics can write to Delta Lake, but you will also see how uh, in this demo, 
how you can create your stream analytics job in SQL and very easy to configure your source destination um, in the Azure portal. Azure Stream Analytics offers native support of Delta Lake, providing a seamless and scalable solution for real-time data processing and storage. In this demo video, we will be showcasing how to identify vehicles with expired registration from real-time toll station data and store the results in a Delta table in Azure Data Lake Gen 2. Let's take a closer look at how to configure a Stream Analytics job to do so. Here we can see the Azure portal and an existing Stream Analytics job. We have already set up the input and query. The input toll booth entry data contains information about cars as they enter toll stations, and reference data input registration lists the expirations of license plate. The query will compare each vehicle passing through the toll booth with the registration information and report any expired vehicles to the output delta table. So now it's time to configure the output. Navigate to the output page, choose ADLS Gen 2 from the adapter list. Here we can name the output alias, select the storage account and container from the subscription. At event serialization format, Delta Lake is listed as one of the options. Once Delta Lake is selected, there will be a new property Delta Table Path. Here you can define both directory path under the container and Delta Table name. Lastly, save the configuration. We can see that the test connection was successful. Now we can start the job and wait for it to run. While it is running, we can go to the storage account following the Delta table path we defined earlier. In the container, Delta Lake, there is toll booth, expired vehicles, and Delta table named demo. Furthermore, the Delta table created by Azure Stream Analytics can be consumed by other downstream products. For example, we can use Databricks to read the output following the Delta table path. The Delta Lake support is also available on Stream Analytics No Code Editor. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, please feel free to reach out. Thank you for watching. All right. Um, I think I'll take some questions later on. But as you could see in the demo, that it was super easy to create source destination and uh, there was no need to write any code. And it was, once the destination um, is source the destination are configured, you can start your job and your job will start ready to destination and processing based on what processing logic you have. You can also, you probably saw there were some metrics there as well. So that helps you monitor the health of your job continuously. We have continuously giving you, we have continuously running metrics, which gives you how many events are coming in, how many events are going out, any delays that, are, that might be happening. Um, what is the CPU person utilization? So those kind of metrics also help you understand the health of your job and uh, the progress and how it's performing. Azure Stream App. Right. So let's talk about no code editor. And it was shown briefly in the previous demo as well. So I've been talking about SQL, right? How you can bring in anomaly detection models, your um, ML models, et cetera. But uh, people do prefer <laughs> writing that processing without a single line of code as well. Uh, you can do that today. Uh, how you can do that is um, uh, these steps that are shown here. But basically, there is zero line of code. And if you try it today, very easy learning curve and very intuitive and drag and drop experience. And once you have created your pipeline end-to-end, -end, you can start and it will be running within a minute. And it's like very productive and instantly you can see the transformation um, logic. It instantly validates it in the sense you can see what are the events that are coming in. And let's say you want to do some processing, uh, what happens after the processing and before configuring the destination, you want to see 
the data instantly. So all these steps help you validate the logic instantly. And then you can oper operationalize your jobs uh, easily as well. You do not have to do any much configurations there. So the steps are that you create event hub first. Um, and um, in there, inside it, you create a job and you just configure your source, destination, and transformation, and that's pretty much it. So let me show you this demo, which will walk you through how you can go into Event Hub instance. There are some templates provided to you and how you can get your real-time data and then how you can process it. Hi, in this demo, I will show you how you can create your stream analytics job using no code editor. If you go in your event hub instance in process data, there are multiple templates available to you where you can process your event hub data using no code drag and drop experience. There are templates where you can build real time dashboard with Power BI, or you can capture your data to ADLS Gento in Delta Lake format, or you can just enrich your data and ingest to event hub. You can also transform and store data to SQL DB, or you can filter and store data to Azure Explorer, and various other formats. We also give you a blank canvas where you can get started without templates as well. For this demo, I will be walking through how you can create this query in No Code Editor. The intention of this query is that let's say you need to count how many number of vehicles that enter a toll booth. And because a highway toll booth has a continuous stream of vehicles entering, those are entrance events uh, and they're analogous to a stream that never stops. To quantify the stream, you have to define a period of time to measure over. So let's refine the question further to how many vehicles enter a toll booth every three minutes. And this is commonly referred to as the tumbling count. So from the list of templates, I will select the Power BI dashboard template, give it a name, your stream analytics job is created within less than a minute. You confirm your event hub details. Within a few seconds, you will see the incoming data preview. So here I have toll booth data where the car model, entry time, state, toll amount, tag, toll ID, et cetera, is given. You land into this no-code experience and there are various inputs that you can add, outputs, or operations. Inputs is the source where your real-time event data is present. Output is the destination where you want to send your transformed real-time data. So we have support for ADLS Gen2, Synapse, Cosmos DB, SQL Database, Event Hub, Azure Data Explorer, and Power BI. There are various operations or transformations available for you as well. You can filter, manage fields, aggregate, join, group by, union, or expand. For this template, manage fields is available, but I want to a combination of group by and then manage fields to match up with the SQL query I showed you. Here I have combined two transformations, group by and manage fields. I will set up my transformation where I can specify what kind of aggregation I want, average count, minimum, max, etc. I will also set up my time window over which I need the aggregation. And this transformation will help me rename some of these fields. I have combined the two transformations, group by and manage fields. In group by, I have assigned a count aggregation over toll ID and a tumbling window of the duration. And from the incoming data, I just want a toll ID and system time stamp and count, which I've renamed to these three fields. And I have set up the Power BI destination where I want to send my transform data. I did the whole pipeline without writing a single line of code. So I will save my job and start it. My job is now running and I can see what is the event hub data that was coming in and what's the data that's going in Power BI. I can also see different metrics where I can monitor the health of my stream analytics job. Now I navigate to the Power BI dashboard that I have created, and you will see that the data is refreshing based on the duration that I have selected. I've created a dashboard for cars which are passing the toll booth, and I did this without writing a single line of code. Thank you for watching. All right. So as you saw in this tutorial, it was like super easy. Um, if you want, you can go the SQL route. If you want, you can go the no code route. And there were multiple uh, inputs and outputs provided to you. You can select any one of them. Um, and you have to no, write not a single line of code to connect to them. 
And then for your transformation also, uh, you can select what kind of transformation you need, like aggregate, join, uh, group by, et cetera. And this was a very simple example that I showed you uh, so that it was easy to understand, but you can make uh, complex queries as well in this no-code editor. And you can start your job and immediately you start seeing the real-time transformation landing into your destinations. All right, in this... All right, so that's it from me. Thank you so much. Uh, this is my, uh, this is our email address for uh, Azure Stream Analytics team. And also feel free to check out um, our Twitter page at Azure Streaming. <coughs> and if you uh, go and search for Azure Stream Analytics documentation, you can read about um, everything that I presented today. Uh, thank you so much. And I will take questions on Q&A chat. Back to you, Gary. Actually, I have a question to ask live, if you don't mind. What's, what's a tumbling window? Yeah, so there are different types of windows, like um, uh, tumbling window, hopping window. So it basically aggregates your data based on, let's say if you say, I want to aggregate data in five seconds or five minutes, or maybe I want to see in last five seconds how many cars passed or Twitter feeds came in. So it helps you to aggregate that data because it's a real-time data. It's already coming in very fast. So it helps you aggregate that data for that specific time window. Now, there are different types of windows. Like when the time windows are moving like this, or you want to uh, have hopping windows. Uh, so there are different types of windows um, that you can configure. Um, I can send you the documentation link, but basically it needs some explanation around how the uh, events are flowing in and how you want to do the aggregation. It all depends on your processing logic. Thanks. Uh, Ajita, I'm also going to throw in another question here. So for the no-code authoring experience, that is super cool. That is something that I think even in LinkedIn, we can definitely learn from. So when, when you create that uh, DAG, so to speak, did you persist it in a SQL format or is it some other intermediate representations? Uh, which tag, sorry? Basically the UI, the, the pipeline, right? That you, oh, yeah. you do buy and then you output to a Power BI. Yeah, so that experience today is hosted in Azure Event Hubs and we plan to host the whole experience in Azure Stream Analytics, so. Do you, uh, you save that pipeline in a SQL? Essentially, you generate a SQL statement in the background? Oh, yes. Yes. In the background, basically, the SQL code that you were supposed to write earlier, now you chose to use no-code editor. So no-code, when you do all these transformations and uh, adding a source and destination, so you you can, um, the, the SQL query is basically generated behind the scenes. And um, if you want, you can actually see that SQL query as well by going to Azure Stream Analytics portal. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, looks like uh, we have no questions on Q&A at this point, but thank you very much. This is a super, super cool talk. Yeah, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, uh, Jetha. Uh, so uh, our next talk uh, is titled Cruise Control in Cloudera Data Platform. And uh, we have two speakers from Cloudera, Victor and Tamash. Uh, Victor is a Kafka committer and staff engineer working currently at Cloudera. He focuses on Kafka core and cruise control, but also develops Cloudera's proprietary solutions, CDP private and public cloud to provide better integration with the Kafka ecosystem. And uh, Tamash is also a software engineer at Cloudera. He works mostly on Kafka, Cruise Control, furthermore, Streams Messaging Manager backend and frontend too, but also focuses on other services related to Kafka. Uh, with that, I will leave it to uh, Tamash and Victor. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Afe. I will share, share my screen to see the presentation. And yeah, so, okay. I have to close it just yeah so i'm um going to introduce uh cloud data data, data platform uh briefly and um 
and starting with the platform overview and finishing uh, with where streaming is located to give, uh, to give some context around cruise control in the Caldera ecosystem. And then Tomás is going to talk about how cruise control is uh, used there and uh, what we contributed to it, and what challenges we faced and how we solved them. So, uh, yeah, I had an introduction slide, but uh, apparently it's not needed, thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just uh, go forward. So yeah, um, let's talk about um, the data platform. So it's a complex environment that is used to run uh, multi-analytics workloads. It gives you, it gives the users the flexibility to run their analytics workload in, a multi in multiple environments while um, being the same platform. CDP give, we give users the com a solution, a comprehensive, comprehensive solution uh, with unified security governance that spans across um, the data lifecycle and the control plane that allows them to manage workloads um, and uh, the hardware. On this slide, uh, I would go through the well, the architecture of uh, CDP, starting with the runtime. And CDP is built on top of um, a well-known open source component from edge to AI, like Kafka, Spark, Hive, Impala and a lot of other uh, components. Cruise control is here too. Uh, this form of single distribution that is tested and baked, to get, baked together. And then on top of this, we have the runtime, uh, sorry, we have uh, data services that uh, target a specific point of the data life cycle. The data moves through five stages uh, throughout its life. First, you need to ingest or collect data with uh, streaming and data flow. Then you need to enrich it. Uh, you can clean it up, structure it so that it allows you to uh, easily analyze data. Um, for this, you can use data engineering. Then third, you need to report on that data, generate reports, visualizations, and stuff like that with data warehouse. Uh, then fourth, you need to be able to serve that data uh, with operational database. And then we can, and then you can um, do any kind of predictions with uh, AI and, and machine learning. Um, and besides this, we have uh, Data Hub, which uh, which I will talk more about uh, later on. Okay. Um, on top of this SDX, we have SDX. This is the shared data experience. Um, we, have, we want our users to have a consistent security and governance across CDP, no matter which data service they uh, use or where they decide, decide to run their workload. Um, consistent security means that, for example, data scientists uh, can access finance data without being able to see credit card numbers. It provides uh, like enterprise level security with uh, unified governance. Um, it is built upon Apache Ranger, uh, Nox, Atlas, and Hive Metastore uh, to work together. Um, okay. uh, CDP can be used on multiple, multiple cloud vendors, uh, environments uh, such as AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. They can also use, uh, they can also run uh, CDP on-prem or in a hybrid, hybrid cloud way to uh, where their system is shared between environments, they don't have to pick a single vendor. And finally, let's uh, let's talk about the control plane. Um, this is the user interface that ties the whole platform together. With this, you can manage uh, SDX, uh, data services, and your hardware across hybrid and multi-cloud environments. We have a data catalog, data catalog that allows uh, discovering relevant data, control sensitive information, and track, track lineage across um, across the uh, platform. We have, then we have replication, which uh, migrates data with its security and governance policies, um, delivering complete backup and disaster recovery if needed. Um, it provides easy migration from legacy clusters to cloud deployments, and um, um, it provides hybrid cloud flexibility through continuous synchronization. Then uh, we have Workload Manager, which, which uh, gives uh, complete workload visibility for performance tuning and migration, um, usage-based inside for data model optimization, and um, uh, yeah, an understanding of uh, query performance and improvements. And then on the bottom, we have uh, the management con console, which um, 
simplifies uh, with a single pane of uh, glass that uh, lets you uh, manage CDP as well as legacy CDH and HDP clusters. Uh, those were the legacy Clouder and Hortonworks products and administer a cloud and on-prem resources in a unified way. And you can maintain users and access uh, users and their access. We, we will take a look at it uh, later because uh, that is the most obvious part. Um, yeah, and you can have uh, you can interact with it through uh, the user interface uh, or CLI or a, or an SDK too. So um, I wanted to go over the um, like the product line to give you a context uh, uh, where we use it. So it's quite a versatile platform. You can we can uh, we support various environments, and it is uh, somewhat different in each each environment. So it's worth uh, taking a look at them. Um, the first one is similar to the legacy CDH and HDP uh, products. Um, this is private cloud based uh, on the left side, and uh, PVC based runs on VMs, and uh, it is a cloud data manager bundled together with the runtime, basically. Some components like uh, data visualization, uh, NiFi, Flink, and uh, Cloud Data Data Science Workbench aren't contained by runtime by default, so this can be added on later. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, PVC data services, that is private cloud data services, that is a more complete and featureful version of the PVC line. It uh, has a base cluster that includes SDX and um, a data lake cluster that is used by XDS, SDX. And um, this version has the management uh, console that gives you the ability to manage data services which are run um, on uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, there are three such services, data engineering, data warehouse, and uh, machine learning. And on the right side, we have the pub public cloud line, which is um, the most um, featureful of all. Um, what you've seen on the previous slide is, is, is essentially the public cloud uh, version. In this case, control plane runs on uh, cloud or cloud, um, but you will need to provision a data lake that is used by SDX, and also you need to provision your data services and data hub clusters. So, Talking about uh, Data Hub, if you're familiar with uh, CDH and HDP, then Data Hub will be familiar. Um, it gives, uh, like, it's a flexible uh, platform as a service like experience. It gives full control to provision whatever hardware and services are needed to work on um, your workloads. Users can uh, choose uh, and fine tune their, uh, their hardware the way they, they like to have their workload cluster and uh, Kafka and Cruise Control lives in this environment. And um, yeah, a CDP data app can be provisioned quickly. Later on, we will see a demo. Okay, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned, stream, uh, Kafka and Cruise Control live uh, in Data Hub. Gof uh, uh, data Hub gives you uh, templates that define how a cl cluster looks like. Uh, which nodes contain Kafka brokers and which one runs uh, run Connect or other components. It supports a wide variety of use cases. We have three uh, such templates. One is the light duty, that is uh, like a cost saver. It's a development cluster template. Then we have a heavy duty template where nodes are separated to enable most of the products, production use cases and high availability, which is uh, designed for uh, cross data center application in mind to enable a true stretch cluster. So um, yeah, um, then um, it's uh, full of features like uh, we have monitoring uh, from monitoring to replication. Uh, we have SMM that streams messaging manager that enables to, uh, us to monitor Kafka and Kafka Connect. And uh, we have Streams Replication Manager that is built on top of uh, Mirror Maker 2 that works as an enterprise grade uh, replication service. And also we have uh, Kafka Connect uh, where you can run your connectors. Uh, we have it, it enables CDC via the Bizium as well. It is scalable um, and cruise control was a big help in this. Um, you can upscale and downscale Kafka with a click of a button. New brokers will be populated automatically, um, and Kafka will try to heal itself in case of any uh, problems. 
And uh, yeah, uh, Tomás will talk more about uh, the details. Uh, I just wanted to go through the uh, big picture, uh, the um, overview. And uh, I wanted to show a demo as well. So uh, yeah, I'll just uh, go back to the starting page. Yeah, yeah, once you log into uh, CDP, you will see uh, the data services that uh, you can um, interact with or use. Uh, we won't uh, take a look at this because uh, we, are, we, are, we want to focus on cruise control. And um, yeah, we and then we have the data management, which is um, where you can see the data catalog, data hub clusters, and uh, the management console. I will select the management console and um, take a look at what's here. Um, so here you can see the list of environments. Um, these are um, um, the CDP environments. And uh, we have a dashboard which shows you the physical location of your clusters. And again, uh, you can do user management, uh, interact with data clusters, data warehouses, uh, but we won't look at uh, most of this function because it would uh, take really uh, a lot of time. So yeah, I'll filter for my, uh, my cluster that I created just for this uh, meetup. And um, this is a data lake cluster, um, a light duty uh, with two nodes. And um, if we take a look at the data lake, um, you can um, interact with uh, Atlas or Ranger, set the Ranger, uh, set the policies for, uh, users and um, uh, for processes here and um, yeah yeah let's go through the data hubs uh, to focus on uh, cruise control and this is the streaming data hub it's a high availability uh, data hub as the uh, title showed with kafka schema registries teams messaging manager application manager and cruise control and um, yeah, um, you know, on the bottom, you can see uh, what nodes we have, for example, uh, the layout of the cluster. Okay, demo effect, thank you. Um, and how the cluster is laid out. We basically have, um, uh, you can see we have a core broker and the broker category. And uh, when we scale up a cluster with cruise control, then we scale up uh, this broker category and uh, the template defines uh, three core brokers that are always running and um, um, you cannot scale them up or down. This is just a static group. And we have core Zookeeper. In a high availability setup, these are uh, distributed between subnets. So um, they, uh, so, uh, an outage in one of the subnets will won't affect the um, whole cluster life of a whole, uh, of the whole cluster. And to take a look at cruise control, we don't have a um, a user interface specifically for cruise control yet. Um, we interact with it through this. Uh, sorry, I just have to uh, the zoom header to somewhere else yeah so we don't have um, a specific a specific user interface to interact with cruise control we can uh, set like a configuration for cruise control um, and take a look at instances check uh, its health um, but Tamash will dive uh, more deeply into how do we use uh, cruise, cruise control here I just wanted to show you the settings um, and how you can configure it up. Uh, yeah, there is one way to interact with it in the endpoints, which is uh, you can use the uh, simple REST API right now um, to manually um, start rebalancing, or if you want to manually fix your cluster, then you can start um, interacting with the uh, cruise control here. And um, yeah, I think I'm. I give the, uh, I, uh, I'm that, done with the demo and Tomas, you can take it off from here. Um, and I go back to slideshow.
Okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, my name is Tamesh, and uh, thanks for the interaction for FA. Um, I am a member of the streaming team at Cloudera, as Victor is, and um, in the following uh, 50 minutes, uh, I will show you quickly how Cloudera works with the cruise control. Um, uh, I will talk about, firstly, uh, about the mostly used parts of the uh, cruise control. Our customers are able to use uh, it through its REST API, as Victor showed you uh, in the previous minutes. And uh, they work with the cruise control uh, passively and actively as well. So uh, they are making passive queries like getting information about the Kafka cluster state or just the state of the cruise control itself. Uh, before going into some uh, other active tasks uh, like rebalancing and uh, the cluster load or just uh, uh, the remove uh, load from to a broker or something like that. Uh, Self-healing is also one of the most commonly used parts. Uh, this was also mentioned by Victor. And uh, another important uh, feature is the scaling capability of uh, Kafka brokers. Inevitably, in every uh, production deployment, the number of uh, Kafka nodes required to maintain uh, cluster changes. Balancing performance and uh, cloud cost requires that uh, administrators scale up or scale down accordingly. Uh, I will uh, explain that uh, later to you. And uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I made a blog post about uh, this feature. So if you are interested in that, then uh, you can search for it uh, in the Google with, uh, for example, Kafka scaling Cloudera, and you will find a blog post with the details. Uh, let's go to the goals. We have a lot of goals enabled by default. Uh, for instance, there are a rack, replica, network, disk, CPU, topic and leader related ones. Uh, by default, the self-healing and also the rebalance uh, call uh, is using uh, these set of uh, goals, but uh, you can change uh, to use uh, uh, only uh, specific goals for rebalance, or we have uh, another goal set uh, in the Clouder Manager's configuration page, which, which is referred to the, the uh, self-healing goals. And in that case, uh, those will be uh, used by the self-healing mechanism. Uh, anomaly detection is uh, disabled by default, but uh, it can be enabled. And uh, if a customer do that, then uh, there is a really small set of goals that we will monitor the recover distribution goal, the replica capacity goal, and the disk capacity goal. Uh, they will be uh, checked, and if there are any problems, then the animal finder will show us. And uh, if self-healing is also enabled, then uh, cruise control will try to automatically solve this uh, upcoming anomalies. Or if uh, the uh, self-healing is disabled, then uh, customers can try uh, to do their best uh, in a manual way. Uh, besides uh, the features that we are using uh, in cruise control, we have also contributions. So uh, first of all, I will talk about the security. Security is a really hot topic nowadays. Um, there are numerous uh, attacks, uh, vulnerabilities, exploits, and so on uh, in every minute, unfortunately. So uh, that is why we want to enable more security options for our customers. Uh, so they will be able to uh, work with our services in their preferred secure way. Uh, for instance, uh, in the case of cruise control, we worked on the authentication and the authentication methods. Uh, furthermore, we uh, participated in support uh, for the TLS connection between cruise control and Zookeeper. Uh, beside the security features, we also worked on the metric reporter and uh, enhanced it with the so-called environment config provider. Uh, this uh, gives us a feature to uh, give our 
configurations for the metric reporter through the environment variables. Uh, this can be useful. And uh, we also uh, introduce the vertex-based uh, Swagger UI for cruise control, which makes it easier to call the endpoints uh, through uh, graphical view. Uh, this is uh, not introduced in our cloud environments yet, but uh, uh, there is an ongoing uh, uh, progress. And uh, besides other bug fixes uh, and developments, uh, we created the cloud era specific anomaly detection procedure, which is uh, used by us for scaling up uh, Kafka brokers. Uh, we automatically moved uh, a part of the load to the uh, newly added host uh, to take advantage of the new capacity uh, as soon as possible. So uh, let's continue with the scaling. Uh, and firstly, with the scale up part, uh, this is working with the so called empty broker anomaly finder, which can investigate if there are any empty brokers. So, uh, brokers without load. And after that, it can start a rebalance as part of the self healing. Uh, there is an illustration on the bottom of the page about this mechanism. Um, you can uh, see that there is a new broker. Uh, beside the already existing two. And uh, after the scale up, uh, the new broker will also have some load on it. So that is what we want to do uh, with this uh, anomaly detection and uh, the help and with the help of the self healing. Uh, the anomaly finder can be configured to exclude the recently removed and uh, demoted brokers. So uh, there will be no accidental load on those brokers, uh, which were removed by any reason, uh, if a customer wants that. Uh, we can move to the scale down part. The other part of uh, the scaling functionality is the downsizing. And uh, there was no need to develop uh, new features in cruise control because everything was available for us uh, for that purpose. Uh, there is a long running uh, job uh, in Cloudera, which uh, are responsible for uh, removing hosts from a cluster. And uh, it has a Kafka specific part. Uh, we created a Python script for that purpose with a lot of tests, which is uh, responsible for removing the load from the uh, selected Kafka brokers before the uh, hosts will be removed. And uh, there are a lot of safety checks and the retry mechanism is also included to make this solution as robust as possible. And uh, for example, with the Retry mechanism, we can avoid uh, transient failures like temporary network outages and so on. Uh, yeah, and uh, I already mentioned security. We communicate uh, with the cruise control and uh, SP Nago authenticated and TLS encrypted channels. So uh, it is important because there are numerous calls which are needed for the scale down. Uh, so that is uh, why it's really useful to have these security features enabled. And uh, actually the process uh, is uh, firstly authenticates with the cruise control itself. Then uh, we check if there is a remove broker task already. And uh, if there is, then we have to wait until it is finished. Uh, it is a safety check to not disturb other scale down tasks, if there are any. Uh, after this check, we translate the host names into broker IDs and uh, start the remove broker process with the stop ongoing uh, execution option. So this is a cruise control remove broker call. Uh, and uh, every other executions will be uh, stopped uh, with that option. Uh, and until the uh, process is fully completed, uh, we check several times the cluster status, the remaining load, and the user tasks, if, a remove, if our remove broker execution has a result or not. So uh, the host removal will be only successful if everything went well, 
and uh, there is no load on the broker anymore uh, to prevent uh, any data loss. Uh, yeah, and I, I made another uh, uh, in the previous slide, <laughs> Victor, sorry. Uh, so I made another uh, diagram about that uh, just to uh, visualize it. Uh, so we have a broker which we want to remove, the last one. And after the process, there will be only two remaining brokers and uh, they will hold uh, the uh, load of the uh, removable broker too. Uh, yeah, and we can move to the uh, demo part of the uh, scaling functionality. I was afraid of the uh, demo effects, so I made only screenshots, uh, <laughs> but sorry for that. Uh, yeah, I would like to show you how uh, scaling works in real life for Crowdera customers. So you can see that dashboard that uh, Victor already showed, showed you in the public cloud uh, data hub cluster. And uh, there is an actions button at the top right corner. And uh, if we click on that, uh, then there will be a drop down list menu where we can select the resize option. And uh, this will uh, give us uh, a cluster resize pop up where we can uh, select uh, the preferred host group. For our case, it will be the broker host group. As uh, Victor said that there is a core broker and uh, a broker host group too. The core brokers can be not uh, resized, but the brokers can. So there will be a minimal set, uh, three uh, brokers, which will be always enabled. And, uh, and uh, the Kafka cluster can work with them, but uh, we can resize uh, it to have uh, more brokers uh, if the load uh, wants that. And uh, here we can um, uh, add the uh, brokers or remove brokers with the plus minus icons or just type an exact, exact count. And after that, we can uh, click on the resize button and uh, the process will start it, uh, in the background. Uh, after we clicked on the resize, then um, uh, there will be uh, logs in the event history tab uh, at the bottom of that. Uh, data hub uh, page or dashboard and uh, you can see that uh, uh, these are the uh, scale down uh, fe features logs and uh, we have also logs for the scale up um, it's a bit different uh, and uh, I would like to go uh, to our future plans uh, what are our future future plans yeah, it's uh, just a quarter question. Uh, we have a lot of imp uh, possible improvements uh, in our mind, but uh, currently we are working on a cruise control UI page. This layout will be integrated into the so-called uh, streams messaging manager. And uh, 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 it already provides uh, a lot of useful information for our customers. Um, so, for example, information about Kafka, Kafka Connect, Streams Replication Manager, which is uh, responsible uh, for the Mirror Maker tool uh, stuff uh, of the Kafka, uh, and so on. And uh, if we integrate Cruise Control in that, then uh, all of the most commonly uh, used services around Kafka will be available from one place uh, here. And uh, there is an open PR for this improvement, uh, uh, which is a new contribution from us. Uh, this will provide information about uh, authorization roles for the user who made the query, if uh, security is enabled. And uh, this, this will be useful because uh, if uh, somebody uh, want to have a UI uh, with cruise control, then uh, uh, it can uh, allow uh, to make pages based on uh, the user's roles. And uh, furthermore, we would like to use uh, the vertex-based Swagger UI, as I mentioned before. And um, before this, we must implement the secure communication between the Swagger UI and the cruise control server. So uh, this will be a new contribution in cruise control tool. 
I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, we are open for any questions if you have any. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we have uh, three questions. So uh, the first one is, um, uh, cruise control may not have a good way to authorize uh, the REST call. Just wondering if Cloudera is working on that or are there any plans to open source this part? So there is an authorization model in cruise control, a very simple one where we have three doors, like you are admin and user, and uh, we use that in Cloudera too. Um, we wanted to integrate it with Ranger, but uh, this simple authorization model works for us. And um, that's what the REST uh, calls used to. Um, yeah. The next question, uh, let me know if uh, if this uh, answer is satisfied uh, or uh, you and uh, or otherwise you can ask it uh, on the chat or we can discuss about it. Uh, the second question, is there any way to auto scale brokers based on the uh, workload, uh, Tomás? Currently, there is no uh, uh, way for that. I guess uh, we can uh, only do with do this uh, with uh, self healing, but uh, but uh, not uh, at brokers level, only at load level. Uh, but uh, the broker scaling uh, can be. Uh, made manually only because uh, it's a really hard decision to uh, make uh, if you want to have more brokers and uh, it can uh, cost a lot because uh, there will be more hosts uh, and so on so it's uh, not so simple but uh, currently it's available only uh, in, ma in a manual way so for this one maybe i can chime in uh, to add uh, one recent feature in cruise control uh, there is a provisioner API, but it requires someone to implement that API in order to uh, auto expand or uh, shrink the cluster. Um, so let's say that I'm running it on some cloud provider. Uh, it mm -hmm. needs that specific implementation to interact with their APIs to get the resources. Uh, but uh, Cruise Control provides some recommendations on how many more brokers to add or remove uh, in case there are violations. Uh, of hard calls. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's interesting to us. I think uh, this API. Yeah, we are we are definitely take a look. I I didn't know about this, but then this is this must be. A, I don't know when did you edit this uh, part. Maybe within the last year or so. Within and the last year. At okay. LinkedIn, yeah. we are we are using uh, it for expansion, auto expansion when needed. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. We just re based on the latest one, so yeah, we will take a look. Definitely. Okay. Um, and at the there is another question. The, th the third one during cluster resize, how do you how do you decide which broker to remove? E.g., you remove do you remove the broker with the least amount of replicas, traffic, etc. I think one idea is to minimize the partition movement during resize. So I think it, uh, the, uh, it same goes, uh, the same answer goes uh, for downsizing that's uh, upscaling, but Tamash, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you're right. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we uh, let the user decide which you node know, to remove. Yeah, there is, there is two way uh, for that. Uh, in the demo I showed uh, you, uh, a way where uh, the selection is uh, working in an automatic way, but it uh, not uh, refers to any of these metrics. It's just uh, randomly select a host and it will uh, remove that one. But uh, you can uh, select a specific uh, host if you want uh, at another part of the dashboard. And uh, you can click on a trash icon so you can delete uh, a specific uh, host if you want. But uh, there is no uh, automatic uh, decision about uh, what, what we made uh, on these metrics, uh, but uh, uh, questioner question. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, then thank you, everyone. And I would give back the uh, control to other presenters. Thank you.
Okay, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, one more presenter. Um, Jalen Liu works here at LinkedIn as a senior software engineer. Um, it focused on uh, projects such as storage systems and machine learning. Uh, Jalen's going to talk to us about uh, Venice. Okay, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Um, is that good? Looks good. Okay, thank you. So hi everyone. Um, my name is Jialin Liu from LinkedIn. Um, today I'm very glad to share the Pasha update feature for Venice, which is a, a distributed key value storage system uh, developed by LinkedIn and open source to the communities since last September. So um, I'm going to talk about two major parts in this um, presentation. The first part is like where we will go over the Venice introduction, which we'll talk high level about how Venice data model works and how to write to the Venice. And then we'll dive into the patch update feature, which talk about the feature requirement, like and the design of the feature, and then how it works with the evolving architecture of Venice. And we also cover the API design at the end. Okay. Um, so as we mentioned before, uh, Venice as a distributed key value storage system, uh, it has the eventual data consistency, so which makes it a great fit um, for storing um, and hosting derived data set. So what does the data derived data set means here? It basically means the data set generated from other kind of data set, usually from a source of choose data set, but it can also come in from some other derived data set. So it would be usually be uh, part of the result of the batch processing job or the stream processing job. So link in LinkedIn, the um, Venice has been used to like store different kind of like derived data set. For example, like a training output, uh, which like uh, embeddings or like coefficients. So one famous example would be like people you may know, which is the LinkedIn's uh, recommendation system for connection. So it used the Venice as the feature storage um, to serve as the outer like low latency feature uh, rich, uh, store uh, for uh, online inference for its like online deep learning. And also um, there's some other kind of like uh, derived data set hosting values uh, such as like materialized views for other data sets and so on. Um, by the way, we need to mention here that all the ingestion uh, to the van is asynchronous because uh, this works well with the, the data consistency model and you will maximize the throughput for the uh, to the Venice, right throughput to the Venice, and also provides low latency uh, during the read. And okay, uh, we're going to uh, see the uh, Venice data model. So essentially, every Venice store is a is just a version data set. Um, so as you see in the diagram, uh, they are v1, v2, v3 in the in the single Venice store. So currently, the v2 is the current data set uh, version. You'll be serving the Venice client traffic, rich traffic, and uh, while we, we we may keep the Venice uh, version v1 as the backup version uh, in case we need to roll back, and then if users are creating new version, uh, they will be creating the v3 in the future as a future version. Okay, so since we are talking about how to create the Venice version, then we talk about how to create it and write data into it. So there will be a few ways to quick. I will quickly go over that. Uh, the very the basic way is uh, a batch, batch full push. Uh, essentially, you will do a full push, uh, run a full push job to write uh, to load the data set from a Hadoop grid, and then you will create a whole new data set in the, as a future version. Um, you, you get to know that in the diagram, while the V2 is still being created, the V1 will continue to serve as the current version to the uh, on, online client until V2 is ready. And then we will do a, a version swap. So there will no like um, pause in the uh, client reading. So apart from always creating a new version, Venice always pro also provides different ways to like modify or like append existing data set. So the, the one, was, one way to not modify the existing data set would be incremental push job. So it would be uh, loading um, some delta data set from the Hadoop grid um, to insert or update part of the data set from offline phase. Uh, you need to know that in the in the center of the diagram, there is a near line write buffer, um, which is enabled for all the data set versions. So all the all these kind of like updates to the data set will be populated into the write buffer. 
and then it will be persist into all the versions of the data set and user uh, and on the right the Venice client will now eventually see the data updates um note that we also support the concurrent incremental push so it can maximize the uh, user's write throughput um, apart from like writing data from the offline uh, way, we can also support writing data from the near line. So uh, here we support Apache Samza job. Now, so Samza is the um, another uh, open source linking framework. Uh, it's for stream processing. So also uh, this kind of Samza job can be deployed and listen to the input stream, uh, usually some Kafka topics. And then you will also populate the near line write buffer and persist to the existing version data sets. Um, also note that we also support concurrent Samza jobs. So, so either from offline or online, we, we support concurrent writes. Um, so it will maximize the writer's throughput. Okay, so there's a final way of writing to um, Venice. It's called, it's kind of special, it's called stream reprocessing. So essentially the, the Samza job here can uh, bootstrap a whole new data set. So see in the bottom left bottom corner, uh, there is an input as a Brooklyn uh, bootstrap input. So Brooklyn is the Lincoln's in-house change capture system, which is also open source. So it can listen to the change events from like MySQL or like Oracle DB or some in-house data, data source, and then produce the, the change events. Um, so if we choose the, the Brooklyn to bootstrap um, a whole data snapshot. You can this uh, reprocessing some of the job can create a whole new data set um, as a supplement. Okay, so we go over different type of write methods to the bandits. We can create a whole new version data set, or we can update the existing version rows of the data set uh, from either Hadoop, which is the offline source, and the near line source, which is the Samza. So it makes us thinking like what now. Uh, if we can do further, we to find a granularity, which is like we can we write updates to some columns of some rows. Um, is it possible? So here, um, is we are going to talk about the today's topic, uh, partial updates. Um, first we are going to uh, describe the what partial update is in Venice. So it may, it mainly contains two operations. The main part is the field update, which is updating some columns of a row. Um, the other is the a uh, special operation called collection merge. You will try to add or remove collection items from the collection view. Note in the Venice, um, the collection view is denoted as uh, either set or the map data structure. Um, okay, then here comes a concrete example. So here on the left is the original record. It contains three fields, which is the data source view, a client view, a release view. Data source is essentially a map view. And the client is a array view and the release is a, just a simple string view. So we want to do two updates. We want to add a new client mode um, append the entry called plus client to the client array. And we also want to, since we, we made some authentication, we want to uh, add a re new release number. We want to uh, call, uh, update the release to the Venice 0.2. Um, so, so this kind of rewrite of the event, uh, release view is called the uh, view update. And also uh, the add entry to the climb array is called the collection merge. So you see on the right, the update result. So client, client field will update with a new entry and the, the release field is rewrite and the data source field is untouched. Um, so we don't need to update everything every time. Okay, so before we dive into the design of the partial update, we first need to clarify why we need this at all. So, um, there's different angles to justify this uh, request. So the first thing is um, for many, uh, for some of the Venice use case is simple. Uh, it's just like listening to uh, from some single data source and update some uh, given frequency, that's fine. But for some complex store, which is maintained by different pipelines, it, contain, it may contain different features. And each data kind of features is uh, maintained by different pipeline. For example, in the diagram, you see they are incremental push job uh, updating from the Hadoop brief, or they are some different sums of jobs uh, listening to either the same or the different input streams. And they might be want to be updating different columns of the data set. And since all this uh, feature has different property, they might be triggered and update at different frequency. So if we don't, 
if we don't use partial of A, then we then the user need to re-architect their whole write pipeline, which means they need to somehow and at, at, at some point of their architecture, they need to re um aggregate all the updates at some point and then do a full uh, record update, uh, which is uh, very uh, inconvenient and also very low efficiency. Um, yeah. So apart, uh, so we talk about like efficiency issue here, and then we need to talk about uh, a more important thing, which is the correctness issue. So if we don't, if we don't want to do the partial update, instead we want to do the, the, the classic re-modify write, is that okay in the Venice? Um, actually it's not, because due to the Venice consistency model, you will end up make, making some, uh, contributing to some data loss. So see this example here, um, in the middle of the uh, diagram, there's a near line sums are job, uh, which is listening to some input stream. So, so let's suppose it listens a new event called three, and then it wants to update the, this three into the, our Venice data set. Then if we do re-modify write, it means that they will easily read from the existing data set V1. Um, so what it will get, it will get A equals to one and two um, from the data set, and then merge the new event, which creates A equals to one, two, three. And then you want to easily to put the near line write buffer. So this looks fine, but however, since Ben is eventual consistent, they, the write buffer may contain something that has not yet persisted to the data set version. For example, in here, we have a pending write A equals to one, two, four, not yet checkpoint. So what will it result? It will result in, uh, we put another A equals to one, two, three, and the end result will just be one, two, three, and the property four will be missing. Also, um, we also consider like the scalability of the this re-modified write, even if it can correctly do things, but compared to some like traditional database who is doing the re-modified write with um, like optimistic locking, um, this works, but however, if there is some, they, a lot of the concurrent writers, they will contain the, the, the write and then some, some writes have to retry again and again. Um, however, um, in Venice, we allow the user to just write and um, write the online application to write and then let the Venice server to do the computation, the consumption. So there's no locking happens here. And then the, we, we can maximize the user's write throughput. Okay, so we talk about, we just, just justify like why we need partial updates. And then we need to face the challenges here, like how we um, evolve to support the partial update feature. So the very first challenge happens in the existing, uh, in the original Venice storage replication model. So before partial update is introduced, uh, Venice is running on offline bootstrap online model. Um, so here you see in the diagram, uh, let's suppose Venice uh, data set V1, and each data set is a uh, version is backed by the version topic. And then we will spin up a bunch of replicas um, because we need to support like scalability and also the full tolerance consideration. So each, each replication, each replica will consume from the version topic and it's fine, uh, it's fine. But with the partial update, there comes some challenge. So first of all, it will be duplication because each partial update will result in um, local database lookup and then modify and then uh, and then persist. It will be a three times computation. So it will be at a cluster, at cluster level, it will be very like, inefficient. Also, uh, if there's any bug happening in the replica, it will be hard, it will result in diverge result and it will be very hard for like many maintainers to justify which replica went wrong. And then, and then um, it will be very painful for, the, for debugging purpose. And also there's another challenge is, um, in the ETL workflow. So Venice also support ETL, which is extracting the records from the version topic to the Hadoop grid. So with partial update, the ver version topic would be mix of the put and the update record. So it means that ETL workflow now need to maintain its own like state, local state and do computation. It will be very inefficient and also error prone. So with all these cha uh, challenges in, in considerations, uh, we propose the leader follow state model. So essentially one of the leader replica, one of the replica will become the leader and will be in charge of the 
um, in the right path. So what does the leader replica actually do? It will become the consumer of the nearby right buffer topic and then become the producer of the version topic. All the um, partial update computation will always happen in the leader replica and will not happen in the follow replica. Leader replica will do the computation and send out the update result to the version topic and let the, all the follow replica to consume. Um, so it will achieve the data consistency among replicas. So we will see the example here. Let's suppose we put an uh, update bar here in the nearline red buffer. So essentially leader uh, replica will consume the event and we update the data A x to bar B x to one. And then you will produce this updated result into the version topic, which, which is, the, is a new put event to be A x bar B x to one. And all the follower replica will just consume it and, and no computation happened on the forward side, but eventually they would reach the consistency. And okay, um, yeah, I think this solved the first problem. So which is the uh, consistency issue between inside a single region. However, so in the production environment, we always spin up different uh, multiple data centers or what we call regions um, to serve the local customers with the lowest latency. Let's suppose we have three um, regions, uh, each denoted in different colors. So Venice is also deployed in, in all these regions and we need to maintain data consistency at, as well. So what do we do in the before? So before we use the aggregate, aggregate replication mode. So um, you see in the diagram, there is a central near line right buffer that which is marked as gray color. So all the near line sums a job deployed in the different regions has to write to the, to the nearline right buffer. And we use Kafka Mirror Maker to, to mirror the topic to the local nearline near line buff, uh, right buffer. And also that the uh, local Venice data set consumes it. So there comes two problems. The first problem is like actual data replication here. So you will result in increased data write latency. And also what's the, a worse problem is uh, you, you will see this gray area becomes a single point of failure. So if the supporting cluster downs, all the writes will be stored and it will be like Venice data set will become stale and then we will take revenue loss or some other, other actions. So in order to resolve this kind of like um, single point of failure, we introduce the active active replication. So essentially remove the uh, centralized part. Instead, we will let leader do, do more job. So leader in each region, we essentially consume all the nearline red buffers from all the regions, and we only produce to local region. Um, so, so you see, they would, in case of any region style, the other region can still do the consumption and keep up with the uh, updates. But but you will soon have the question, so how to maintain the consistency between each regions because le different leaders in different regions might consume different uh, buffers at different pace. So the consumption order will be different. Um, how do we maintain eventual consistency? So here uh, we use the timestamp-based replication metadata um, to do the perform the conflict resolution to con achieve consistency. So the example here, so in, in the yellow buffer, we have one event, which is put x1, bx bar at timestamp x1. And then in the, in the blue buffer, we have the other put x10, b equals to pop at timestamp equals to two. And then um, let's assume that all the leader replica always consume the local uh, buffer faster. So what will happen? It will happen first, we will consume the local message and update locally, which is fine. Uh, a, um, the leader replica yellow uh, will become x1 b x bar and the blue replica will become x to 10 b equals to pop. And then the interesting part happens. So um, the leader replica in the yellow part, we consume the need, uh, the message from the blue buffer, which is the consumed x10 b equals to pop at timestamp equals to two. It will consume it because the incoming rise timestamp is higher than the existing um, value, it will take it. However, for the blue leader replica, it will reject it because it has timestamp equals to two as existing value. However, the incoming write has timestamp equals to one. So hence it will reject it. 
So you see, even though the behavior is different, however, the end result will be the same. They will, they will achieve the same data consistency. And as, as we mentioned, uh, we will populate the data, the, the updates through the leader follower model and the follower replicas will also consume and have the same data um, at the end. So this is cool, but in, now when combining with partial updates, things can become a little bit tricky because the partial update can update a single view. However, we keep the timestamp here as the value level view. So what do we do? So we essentially evoke the a timestamp metadata again. We we let the timestamp metadata be, to become a field level, and also, and also for the collection field, we maintain the timestamp, the update timestamp for each item respectively. So let's take a look at an example. So um, let's only consume the uh, let's only consider a map field, which is A with uh, three values full bar and bus. So we we run three operations, which is the first one is the, re, the whole rewrite at timestamp equals to two. And then we update to set A to be bus equal to four and timestamp equal to five. And then we delete one element, the, the quarks, at timestamp equal to six. What, what will we end up? It will end up with value full equals two, bar equals to one, bus equal to four. And we maintain the update uh, timestamp here, uh, two and two and five respectively. And then we also keep the deleted element, the quarks here, as the, also the deleted element, uh, timestamp six. So uh, we also maintain some additional metadata to keep track of the, was the last time the whole field was rewrite. So we will see some example of how um, this kicks in when there's some rise with stale metadata. So for example, uh, in, the, in the first one, it will be the whole uh, field rewrite will be a x to one a x a with four x to three and bar x to four and timestamp equals to one. We will reject it because the additional metadata shows we have higher timestamp. This whole field has been rewrite in the timestamp equals to two. So this is a stale right rejected. And we we also shows that um, the second operation try to add a new bus of um, item at timestamp equals three. We also reject it because we see that the item bus has the time last up latest updated timestamp at, at five. So this is also a stale, right? And uh, also the third point, an uh, interesting update, which is try to add the course equal to 10 back to the map value. So you will see the, the course uh, does not exist in the current map value. However, we will still reject it because we, we keep track uh, we keep track of the when the when the last time it was deleted, it was deleted at timestamp equals to six. So this is another stale right operation, and we are also reject it. Yeah. So with this kind of like um, timestamp based uh, conflict resolution, we will be able to achieve region level consistency with all the with partial update and with all the replicas in different regions. Um. So one more thing. So um. After we resolve all these challenges, or we only mentioned two challenges here, but there are some a few more. Um, but it should be fine. Um, we will talk about the user face API design. So you see here, it's only a, just a string array view, so it looks fine. Uh, user can handle with that. However, if you want to play with partial update, then it means that the partial update schema needs to support either whole field update or like collection view update or like try to add items or remove items. And then you, you would also let users do uh, specify do nothing, which is um, they don't update this uh, field at all. So it results in kind of a schema explosion. So user had to play with this um, gigantic field schema just for a single field. However, in the real production stores, we only see like, like tens of um, schemas test schema fields. So it's error prone for user to interact with it and it's, it's very uh, not user friendly. So what do we do? So we create the update builder interface to support this uh, use case. So let's back to the original example. Uh, we want to up rewrite the release field and we want to add a new entry to the client uh, field. 
So with the list update builder interface, we will be creating a new update builder in the below. And then we will just like set new field value with release and release as the, the, the field name and the new value as the is 0.2. And then for the collection merging operations, we will just like set elements to add to the list field with the field, um, field name and also the delta we want to add. And then we just call the build. And then it will generate the partial update record and we will send it to the Venice. It's just less simple. Okay, we are done with the um, API design and we're just putting it all together. So, so now with the partial update, we will be able to do uh, right to the Venice system with different kind of granularity. So we will be we will have the full data creation, like update to some rows of existing data set. And we'll be able to update some columns of some rows through the offline or online mode. So incremental push job we're doing partial update for the offline mode and the some of the job we're doing streaming rights um, for partial updates. Um, so let's end up with uh, one like end-to-end -end pipeline. So every uh, new lines job in different regions will be deployed here and then listening to some input streams. And then it would, for every event, it would just generate uh, new data to the uh, new line write buffer. And then we would use, um, so each leader rep replica we consume from all the existing, all, all the regions uh, write buffers, and you will use few level complete resolution to solve it, um, to, to resolve, to, to either take or reject incoming writes. And then you will consume it and then produce to the, the final follow replica. So we see here, um, it, would, it would take different, um, different rights are put uh, into the different buffers. And then we will use the same field level complete resolution um, to either take it or, or, or just uh, reject it. So it will end, you will see, and eventually it will end up with the same value in all the replicas in each now uh, every region, regions. Yeah, I think um, that's all I want to share. So since Venice is open source, we are looking forward to everyone who wants to either trial Venice or like contribute to Venice. We have some resource here, uh, like we have the code available in the GitHub. We have the open Slack channel. And you, if you want to uh, read all the features, you can go to the venicedb.org. Uh, and we also regularly post a new a blog post about our new features and our new achievements. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, John, I don't, I don't know if you can see it, but in the, uh... Q&A, there's a question um, for you. Uh, maybe I'll read it live. How do you sync the clock between hosts? For example, if the clock on, if the clock on host one and clock on host two ha have different times in the local clock, then the timestamps are not comparable. Um, so so the timestamp is, is the incoming right timestamp. And so it's, 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 um, it's written inside the incoming incoming uh, either put or update request. So it's generated on the Samza um, producer, or it can it can be this, the system timestamp of the Samza producer, or the user can choose to specify logical timestamp. So we, we use the, we rely on this to do the, uh, do the decision. We don't rely on the server timestamp to do the decision. Does that answer the question? I think so. It so sounds like you've answered it. Sure. Um, so I see the, uh, the, uh, the second question from Jaya. Hash update with the timestamp base. When it be slow as the timestamp needs to man be maintained for <clears throat> each field. So yeah, they, they comes with some codes um, during the uh, right, right pass. However, uh, you see, um, we, we only maintain like at item level timestamp for the collection view, um, we own uh, for for different for other fields we only maintain field level timestamp, and we also maintain different kind of level of cache to make sure that we don't look back always look back to the disk um, to like read the timestamp and then do the resolution and then do the computation. How, but we have to admit that it, it does come with a cost. It's, it's it, it will. Um, it's not, it will not be as far as like 
running through without timestamp model. Does that answer your question? And also, yeah, I was gonna say, I think that um, audience probably can't, or participants can't speak live. So uh, you will have to assume that that answer the question. Yeah, if there's any question, feel free to join the Slack channel and we can talk. Um, the third question is, um, is leader to leader a single async? So we don't do leader to leader um, operations. Um, we, we only do leader to version topic and then version topic to the, um, to the uh, follower replica. I hope this answers your question. Um, if, if it does not, feel free to check out events db.org, there should be um, more like diagram. Yes, and the, and the third one, yeah, I think Zach already answered the question. We all usually keep two at the most, yes. I think there was, a, I had one more question I was hoping I could ask you live. What's um the OBO model you mentioned earlier in your slides? Yeah, um, it's just a, let's go back. Here, right? So it, it's just the original offline bootstrap online. So it, uh, each replica, we only have the offline uh, bootstrapping and online three states. It does not um, have different roles between different replicas. It's just the simplest uh, model. Thanks. Uh, Jiang, can I ask a question here? Yeah, sure. Um, so looks like the leader node is able to sort of reconstruct the updates using timestamps. Uh, in that case, why don't we make all the replica nodes do the same and kind of don't do this uh, version topic in between? So, um, you mean if leader can do the computation? Yeah, so repeat the same logic. So basically there's no intermediate step with this version topic in between. Is there any downside to that? So if I understand correctly, then it goes back to the original um, OBO model, right? That means that every replica will do the, um, do the computation on its own. And also we have to keep a version topic here. We need to persist, sorry. Persist all the message. Persist all the message uh, for for this data set version. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I think we've answered all the questions. Um, so let's see, uh, I guess, thank you very much to all of our presenters. Uh, it was great to uh, hear your, see your and hear your presentations. Um, thanks also to all the participants. Um, uh, two more things. One is I'll drop this into the, uh, the Zoom chat right now. There's a uh, in-person event coming up uh, this Friday, April 21st, an in-person LinkedIn Women Connect Spotlight. So uh, uh, please consider going to that. As I said, I put it in the chat. Um, and then uh, we hope to see you at a future meetup. Uh, probably have one in another three months or so. So thanks everyone for for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You.